Yeah, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be with you today to worship and to celebrate. And uh, uh, Brother Tipton, I was thinking I had two services instead of one. So I calculated, I've got about an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can get it in that time. I don't know if my voice can last that long, so I know I'm looking out today. But it is a pleasure to be here and to see all the smiling faces. And I am thankful. I am thankful for this church, for each one of you. I'm thankful that God has called you into his kingdom of heaven in such a special way that you are willing to go out into the world, go out into the unknown, venture out of your comfort zone, and to be a living witness of God's love and grace in the life of the people where you serve around the world. I know that Mark and Linda and I are especially grateful that you come to work with us at Project Crossroads because you help us to be in ministry. Our ministry, some of you uh, learned a little bit about it this morning, but just share briefly. We're a housing rehab ministry in Southwest Virginia, uh, and we serve the needs of those that are low income, elderly, and handicapped. We try and make their homes safe and secure, make them accessible. And a big part of our ministry is the, the volunteer work teams that come to serve with us throughout the year that enable us to have the resources, but also the hands and the feet be able to do the work to repair homes and make them safe and make them accessible. But more than that, to transform lives, to let folks know that they're not forgotten, but that they are remembered. To know that when they can no longer get out and go to church, by golly, the church will come to them and take care of them and be a living presence of what it means to be the church, to be the body of Christ, and to be at work in the kingdom that we call earth, and to be... More than that, a source of love is the love that transforms lives. So I'm thankful today for the church. I'm thankful for Christ who makes all this possible and that brings us together. And thank you for the invitation to come and to share with you. Also with Project Crossroads, this time of year, we're in our firewood ministry. So we provide firewood to families that is the primary or only source of heat. And we deliver firewood until we run out. Uh, sometimes that's as early as January, and sometimes we can make it all the way to March before we run out of firewood. We also have a ministry that began before Project Crossroads as a part of our ministry. We provide a community Thanksgiving meal. And uh, so uh, we will be uh, serving meals in a church in Marion, Virginia, and also delivering meals to those that can't get out and those that don't have folks to gather with on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, and some folks, this is their Thanksgiving every year to come and to work with us and help prepare the meals and to, to get those ready to go out. We also work with our conference in the disaster relief program and we uh, deliver uh, cleaning buckets and hygiene kits. I know y'all probably put a bunch of these together over the years, haven't you? Oh, can you turn my, I can't turn it up. They want to turn it up. <clears throat> he can also turn me off, you know that, right? <laughs> okay, all right. That's what I worry about. Uh, but we store those and, uh, and, and then we deliver those in time of disaster. Right now we've got somewhere around 2,500 uh, cleaning buckets on hand. Some of those aren't complete. We're going to have to open them up and find out what they're missing. And a church is actually going to help buy the materials to complete those buckets so they'll be ready to go. And we've probably got about 4,000 or better hygiene kits ready to go when we have the next disaster. And then also we're in medical ministry. We can partnership with our... Uh, uh, local free clinic and I'm a provider there as a, as a physician assistant and so I see patients that don't have insurance and help provide their medical care. Working with a the conference then we also work in South Sudan and Uganda uh, and uh, uh, taking care of folks there and also I don't know if you're familiar but with RAM clinic if you want to ask about that afterwards we have a yearly clinic where we set up at Emory and Henry College now and we treat folks for dental vision, medical, and hearing needs uh, in the region. So God has blessed us, opened the doors to a lot of ministries, and sent a lot of folks through our community that I get to know and work with and meet in, in numerous churches and numerous denominations. And it's been a blessing. And so today we celebrate that, and I celebrate with you. You heard the scripture this morning. Let's bow our heads just a moment. Lord, is the bread of life has been broken before us with open hearts and minds and souls. 
let us partake of the feast that you've set before us. And Lord, in this mealtime, fill us, nurture us, awaken us, that as we go forth this day, we might go forth into the world more prepared with a stronger hope and sense of faith and love to be a living witness of your love and your grace in this world daily. Amen. So, he could answer all the questions and he answered them properly and he, he knew what the Scripture said. You know, we, 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 we try and learn all the Scripture we can, don't we? We try to know what Scripture says and how that's applicable to our lives. He said you got to love God with all your heart and all your soul, all your strength and all your mind, right? And your neighbor as yourself. But his first question, if you remember, was simply this. What must I do to have eternal life? And we can ask that question in a lot of different ways. And part of it might be, Lord, how do I know if I'm righteous enough? Lord, am I faithful enough? Lord, have I been good enough in my life? We can ask it in a lot of different ways, can't we? That's the broad question. That's like when a teacher asks you to write a report five pages long, and so you're thinking, uh, can it be on anything? Because I've got a report I wrote about three years ago, and all I have to do is make the corrections the teacher put on the paper when I, read, when I got it back, and I can resubmit. Oh, some of you are shaking your heads. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and you can resubmit that. That's the broader question, isn't it? But when Jesus told the story, it was a more specific question that was posed. But it's in response to the question that he then asked. So who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? That's the next question we ask the teacher. Can this be single space or double space? <laughs> Because if it's double space, I don't have to write near as much. What's the least I can get by with? What's the least that I have to do? What's the least that I have to give out, give away, or invest in? What's the least that I have to put myself in an uncomfortable situation? Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? So Jesus tells a story, doesn't he? And the story becomes sort of the window to the world. But more than that, it becomes also the mirror of self-reflection. All of his stories do because they help us to see the world in a different perspective, but also see ourselves in light of something else because the wind also becomes the skylight that allows the sunshine in and enlightens us to a new understanding of God's love and God's grace. Let me tell you about a fellow I want to introduce you to. Man, excuse me. And bless you. And um, this fellow is a burly fellow. A fellow used to go to United Methodist Church in Marion. Something happened years ago, and he never shared the story, and I never really knew, but he quit going. He worked heavy equipment, worked with a lot of rough folks in construction trade. He liked to drink a little bit, smoked a whole lot. Didn't really take care of himself. Was kind of gruff when you talked to him. 
wasn't the folk that you think that would probably be stepping out trying to help anyone. He's the one you probably would go to last. You probably wouldn't want him around. Sometimes his language wasn't the best in the world. This man's Frank Willard. Now I want you to kind of remember that because I'm introducing him to you. I want you to know him, but you're going to discover more about him in just a moment. So Jesus tells the stories. All the folks in the stories that he tells, they have a reason, don't they? To justify why or why not I might help this individual. They can make up reasons. They can make up excuses. We can make up excuses for who our neighbors are, can't we? They have to look like us. They have to dress like us. They have to be the same economic class. They, they, have, to, they have to fit in. They have to be the image that we've created that our neighbors ought to look like and be in the world around us. And not just as individuals, but also as a church. Don't we often do that? We pick and choose. Sort of like the rabbi and the priest. They could justify, they could justify why they didn't have to stop. What did it say in the Scripture? He was trying to justify himself, wasn't he? Who is my neighbor? He asked. Because he didn't do, want to do any more than he would have to and reach out any further than was required. When we first started the project, before we became Project Crossroads, I got a call by Harry Fleming and said, I want you to go with me to see this family. They need a bathroom. They've got a son that was injured in a car wreck and his physical condition is deteriorating such if they keep him at home, listen to this now, they're going to have to have indoor plumbing. They had no indoor plumbing. No bathroom. Not even a kitchen sink. Their water came to the outside. Kind of like the Harris's that we worked on. And I said, well, I'll go look at it. And we went and we visited the family and I saw the problem. The house sat across the creek. And all the bids were way over the limit that they could award to get a house, to, excuse me, get a bathroom put in that house. Because one, they're going to have to get septic tank across the creek. Two, they're going to have to build a bathroom under the house. So I said, well, let me see what I could do. And I, I was able to come up with a plan and, and we could get the material and the volunteer workers and we could actually put that bathroom in and build the bathroom. The only problem, we had to get the septic tank across the house. So the first thing we want to do is get the septic tank across the creek to the house before we started to know that we could do it. Put out word in all the churches. Anybody that's got equipment, we need your help. Not a single person. I even called a number of them. No, we can't help you. I even tried to get a farmer with a big old tractor. And he said, Nah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm too busy. I can't do that. And I was about ready to give up. No, he said, Why don't you call Frank Willard? I didn't know who Frank Willard was. I called Frank Willard and he said, I tell you what, this is on a Friday. And he said, Meet me down there Sunday afternoon and I'll look at it and we'll see what we can do. And he met me there and he said, I'll see you in the morning. Bring a couple of folks with you. We'll get that septic tank across the creek. I pulled up and waited. Frank showed up. His son showed up with a dump truck, with a trailer, with a backhoe. Another fellow showed up with a truck pulling a trailer with a bulldozer. We got the septic tank across the creek. They dug the hole. They put the septic tank in it. We sealed that. They dug the lines and we put the pipes in before dark that day. Got the inspector there two days later. They inspected it. They came back and in one day they covered it up and graded everything and never charged a penny. I never would have thought of that. That this person all burly and, and just rough around the edge would be willing to do something like that. That became part of the push to make this a full-time ministry mission. To connect folks. Even those that were unchurched. But those that somehow 
had a glimpse of the kingdom. Remember the Samaritan? He had no obligations whatsoever. But he stopped. He did all that he could to make sure that this person was taken care of and survived and said, now when I come back, anything else you spend, I'll take care of it. I'm not just dropping them off and leaving them. I'm hanging in there to the end until he's well and on his feet. See, Frank stayed with us if he'd just brought the septic tank across the creek, then I still would have had to dig a hole and get it in the ground and do all that work besides building a bathroom onto that house. You see the connection? And then what does Jesus ask? Here's the critical question. Because we always ask and we forget there's a second half to that question. Who do you think was the neighbor to the one in need. We try and identify our neighbors as those that we want to serve, don't we? What we ought to be asking ourselves, remember I said it's the wind of the world, we're looking out into the world, and we see all the need around us. But it's more than that, it's a mirror in which we look at ourselves and we ask ourselves, are you that neighbor? Are you that neighbor? Because when he asked the lawyer, he said, who was the neighbor? The lawyer said, the one that showed mercy. Compassion. Selfless love. Concern. And brought transformation to this young man's life. You see, the neighbor is not necessarily those we look around and try and identify that we want to serve. We should be the neighbor to any that God places before us in life. And just like Frank, Frank had no obligation. But he took his whole crew and gave three days to help us help a family in need. Who is the neighbor? the neighbor to the world, the neighbor to the poor, the lost, the neighbor to the disenfranchised, the neighbor to those that, well, they're hungry and they're thirsty, they're naked and they're in prison, they're displaced in their refugee camps, their lives are shattered by war and by disease. Those are our neighbors. But that's not the question. Can we be the neighbor to those in the world who need to know the presence, the love, and the grace of Jesus Christ and know that God has not forgotten them, but is always there? Now I'm going to take it a step further. I can answer for the church. I can, and I know you've noticed that since you've been here, what, almost two years or on your second year? You are the neighbor in the world. You've been to Panama, you've been to Belize, you've been to ASP, you've been to Project Crossroads of all places. You've been in my community serving folks that you had no clue who they were till you got there. You've given your talents, you've given your resources, you've given your time, but more than that, you've given your heart. In fact, one family, they they come up and visit, and and I've got to remember because she gave me a jar of honey I was supposed to bring you all, and I forgot and left it sitting on the counter. I promise I won't eat it. I'll give it to you. But the medleys, they've even come up here, and you've hosted them here in this church. You didn't have to do that. You didn't have to do that. I'll take care of whatever's left. You all do that. You're a living witness of this story. You've seen through the window. You've gazed into the mirror. 
and you've experienced the empowerment of the holy light that beams down from above. I thank God and I'm thankful for you for you in this Christ, uh, Christmas in this Thanksgiving season for your love, your dedication and for the opportunity that I've had to be able to work with you as you have been the neighbor to our community, to our folks, but not only us, but the rest of the world. Who is my neighbor, we dare ask, for well, we really want to know. Now the command others love, well, it's sometimes hard to show. So they can be those we choose, those who dress and look like us, and those whose skin is just right, it's our choice with little fuss. And they can be ones with wealth who reciprocate with pay when we offer them a hand, stop to help them on their way. Yes, can they be the ones we know, thus and no risk that we must take, to gladly serve when in need, feeling good for our own sake? Lord, can they be far from us, so their hunger we can't see, or their pain and misery are but lives they chose to be? A neighbor's who, you do it, dare say, is the one whose life is love, the one who is there when in need, like my Father from above. The neighbor's one who is there with unselfish, eager love to serve all those when in need whose reward is from above. We are called to do likewise, be a neighbor every day, living with a Christ-like heart, serving all along the way. Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? That's not the question, is it? Am I the neighbor to the world? In the name of Christ, amen.